So I don't know if you have, as we think the last several weeks about God speaking to us, if you have ever thought you have had a, a, a word from the Lord, that God spoke to you through his, his Holy Spirit. Um, one night I woke up in the middle of the night. That doesn't happen to me very often. When I'm asleep, I'm asleep. Can I get an amen from anybody else that identifies with that? I'm a very hard sleeper. Once I'm out, I'm out. And I wake up much later, you know, when the alarm goes off for about five minutes straight. Uh, I'm a very hard sleeper, and it's, it's done well for me uh, in the past. Um, I don't know about, you know, other people, but it's done well for me. So I'm a hard sleeper. I, I enjoy that. But I woke up in the middle of the night one night, completely awake, completely coherent, completely aware of everything that was going on, which, again, is abnormal. Because if I do wake up in the middle of the night, it's usually very fuzzy, and I'm trying to figure out what woke me up. Couldn't think of anything that woke me up that night. But I had this thought in my head, a thought that I hadn't been dwelling on before that. It's a phrase, a sentence that came to me, something that I, in the days after I tried to rack my brain to think if anybody else had spoke something like that to me or if I had read it anywhere. I Googled that exact phrase to think if somebody else had heard, had said it before, if another Christian teacher had said it before, and it was something that I mulled over for quite a while. And I'm a, believe it or not, I'm a skeptic by nature, and so I tried to figure, figure out a, a million ways why that couldn't be something that God was actually trying to say to me. But the more and more I thought about it, the more I took Scripture's account, the more I bounced it off of other people, I decided that that word, and I'm, I'm not telling you what it is because it was specifically for me, that, that that word was something that I needed to hear and that I truly believe was something that God had for me to learn, something that God had to say to me. Have you ever felt the Holy Spirit leading you similarly in a particular direction? Maybe you've had a dream, uh, a, over, a, a recurring dream about a big decision coming up in the future, or you repeatedly get convicted to, toward a certain action every time that you pray, or it seems like every book you read, conversation you have, Bible study or Sunday school that you attend or sermon that you hear leaves you with the same exact exhortation, the same exact conviction towards a particular action. Or maybe it's just something that you can neither deny nor explain, an inner voice that you feel is leading you towards a certain behavior. Maybe it's not even something that you can articulate as, as God pushing you a certain direction, but maybe it's something that you don't even want to do, something that you would never even think to do, and so you would articulate it as God dragging you a certain direction rather than God pushing you. If so, if you have been there, if you are there, you might just be hearing a word from God. Notice that I said might. I'm really going to focus on that word for the rest of our time together. You might have heard a word from God because I have also had in my own experience a leading from God that I would articulate that way at the time that I found out later was definitely not of the Lord. So again, over this series, God Speaks, we have been looking at the idea that God speaks to us today. We started with the idea that God has said everything that needed to be said through the person of Jesus Christ. We looked Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, that God tells us through the author of Hebrews that God has spoken in many ways and in many times to people throughout the Old Testament. But in these days, in these last days, which continue on for us, that God has spoken in the person of Jesus Christ, saying everything that needs to be said and everything said after that, everything that we say, every time that the Holy Spirit speaks to us today is an echo of what God has already said through Jesus Christ. And last week we looked at the idea of one of the main ways, or the main way that God speaks to us today through his son Jesus Christ. The way that God speaks through Jesus, the main way today is through the Bible, through God's written word. That if we look there, we hear and we see the voice of God that we can put into our lives and that we can live according to. But today we're going to look at the idea of God speaking directly through his spirit. God speaks through through Jesus, through his spirit, in accordance with his word. Now, this is not to be taken lightly, because in today's culture, we can make one of two mistakes on either direction. We assume that everything we feel is from God, that every gut feeling that we have must be something that God is trying to say to us, or on the other side, we miss and ignore leadings that the Holy Spirit is placing in our lives because we don't think that God can speak that way. As a believer, you have the responsibility 
to both listen for the voice of God within and around you and to test every voice that you hear. So if you want to digest this in the three words, this sermon is listen and test. Listen to the voice of God and test every voice that you hear, even your own, against the greater truth of Scripture. We're going to look again in Scripture in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 31, and to see an example through a character that we saw last week, the Apostle Philip, the way that God uses him, speaks to him, in order to see his will accomplished. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, he being the Ethiopian, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. Now that's where we're going to start reading, but this, I would encourage you on your, on your own time to read the, the remainder of that chapter of what happens with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. That Philip, ask him what he's reading, the Ethiopian eunuch describes what he's reading, quotes from the prophet Isaiah, says, who is this about? Is it about the prophet or is it about somebody else? The, the Ethiopian asks Philip. And Philip, starting with that scripture in Isaiah, begins to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ from the scriptures. The Ethiopian, after hearing this truth, looks and sees some water and says, what's to keep me from being baptized right now? They stop, they get out, he's baptized. Philip is led away by the Spirit. That's another interesting passage we could talk about at a different time. But Philip is led away by the Spirit uh, when the Ethiopian presumably goes back home, travels back to Ethiopia to serve in his duties with the gospel of Jesus Christ firmly planted within him to such a degree that one would think it probably started to make a difference in the people around him. So again, as we think about this scripture, and we think about God speaking through his spirit, I want you to see that it's not just something we think about, it's something that God does in scripture. God does indeed speak through his spirit. Philip heard both from an angel directly, an angel of the Lord, and directly from the Holy Spirit himself. Now, you might wonder, why didn't the Holy Spirit just speak to the Ethiopian eunuch? Obviously, that's who the word was for. God wanted to empower Philip to go speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. So, why didn't God just cut out the middleman and go straight to the Ethiopian eunuch? Now, it's not that God couldn't show up and speak to a non-believer. He does so in Acts chapter 9 when he shows up to Saul on the road to Damascus and tells him some pretty important truths that would lead him to become Paul, the apostle, who would share much of the New Testament with us. So God does indeed speak to people who didn't believe in Jesus, but most of the time what we see happen is God empower his followers. God empower the people who have the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ dwelling within them, which is who Philip would have been, not the Ethiopian eunuch. If he did not believe in Jesus, he did not have that relationship, that presence of the Spirit within him. And so instead of speaking directly to the Ethiopian, God empowers Philip and plants a word within him and then leads him to share that word with others. So God speaks to unbelievers, and we'll look at this in the days to come, in the weeks to come, by using his church to speak truth. And we also see the Ethiopian eunuch learn truth from reading from Scripture itself, like we talked about last week as he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, I think the immediate reaction to this in our cynical world, and I, and I told you that I am by, by nature... I blame it on nature. I, I am a skeptic when it comes to a lot of things that are unbelievable or hard to see, or that seem unbelievable, I should say. And, and, and from this worldview, which I think much of the world shares today, where it's hard to believe things like God actually speaking to us, we might come at this and say, well, that, that, was, that was then. God doesn't speak to us today, right? We, we might say that that was just for the apostles, but in Acts chapter 10, God shows up again through an angel to speak to Cornelius, who is 
a Gentile who is a Roman centurion, and God speaks to him by, by sharing him truth in much the same way that he speaks to Philip. Or, or maybe we would think that God doesn't speak anymore outside of the New Testament like he does here, that it was specifically for this time, but that idea isn't found in the New Testament. Romans 1 tells us that God communicates even through creation. I want to encourage you to go read Romans 1. That God speaks through the physical world to such a degree, according to Paul in Romans 1, that no one on earth who has seen God in creation is without excuse when it comes to knowing that there is a God. God speaks clearly enough in Romans 1 for that to be, or clearly enough through, through, through the physical world for that to be the case according to Romans 1. And we have many places in Scripture like this passage here in Acts 8 where God, through His Spirit, speaks directly to His followers. And so we see this happen over and over again in Scripture, but there's still that seed of doubt in our head, I think, where we think that God, God can't speak to me that way. Or that God can't move that way anymore in the world. And, and let me tell you, I think that comes more from our own experience than it does from some scripture. Uh, we talked about last week how experience isn't nearly as trustworthy, trustworthy as the word of God. What we see in the word of God is that God speaks to people in this way and we don't see him undo that at any point. That God stops speaking to people through his Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about signs or miracles or anything like that, but merely the presence of the Holy Spirit speaking to people that God still acts in that way. We don't see that undone, but we tell ourselves that maybe God doesn't speak to us that way because I think it's one of two reasons in our experience. One, we have seen someone abuse the statement, God told me, fill in the blank. And then not only is what God told them not anything that God would say, but it's something that's actually harmful to someone around them or harmful to an entire community full of people. Not only have we seen that in the world, we see that in the world. We see people who are spokespeople of God who say things that God would not say and lead entire groups of people astray. And so maybe that's burned us. And we want to say that God can't communicate through his Holy Spirit. Or maybe, and this is probably more likely, of an experiential reason why we would say that God isn't going to speak to me, is that, well, God doesn't. That maybe it's been a while since you've heard a word from the Lord. Since God has impressed upon you a truth through the inner dwelling of his Holy Spirit. Maybe it's been a while since you've been there, and so you assume, well, it's not happening to me, so it can't happen. That's what most skepticism is, if we're being honest. Well, I haven't seen it, so it must not be possible. And so we completely dismiss that possibility. And by dismissing that possibility, we miss a truth or an opportunity that God might be sharing with us. Now, I want to go back to Scripture and be sure that's the reason why we've come in this progression that we have over the last few weeks that God speaks through Jesus that is primary that is the ultimate foundational truth and that the main way that he speaks through Jesus today is through his holy word through scripture itself and so as we build upon that we come to this conclusion or I come to this conclusion that God through his spirit speaks of particular and contextual ways to obey what he has already said in his word. Let me say that again. That God, through his spirit, speaks of particular and contextual ways to obey what he has already said in his written word. We see it in the story that we just read. Philip, one of the apostles, was with Jesus when he gave the Great Commission. He had already received God's direction on the importance of spreading the gospel. Philip knew to go and make disciples because he had heard from the mouth of Jesus itself, he had heard Jesus say those very words. Philip knew what he was supposed to do. But the angel shows up and applies some specific nature to that. Tells Philip where to go, which direction to go. And then after the angel shares that word, Philip, who knew to make disciples again because he had heard the word of Jesus command him to do so, he heard the Spirit tell him how and where to do just that. That the way he was to go and make disciples, the way he was to go and spread the gospel, was to come up alongside this Ethiopian's chariot. 
And it's only then when Philip obeys the Spirit's impression on his life, comes up beside the chariot, that he hears the Ethiopian reading the prophet Isaiah. Now that was very common then for people to read out loud because when we think of reading, we think of reading silently, but we're in a very, very, very literate culture compared to even the most educated back then. It was rare to get things written down on paper. And so if they were going to read something, especially in a language that was not their own, they were going to be reading it out loud so that they could make sure they were understanding it and hearing it correctly. And so Philip, being impressed by the Spirit, comes alongside, hears the Ethiopian reading those words and says, only because he obeyed the Spirit's movement within him, hey man, do you know what that is talking about? Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch, who does not at this point have the Spirit dwelling within him, says, how can I know unless, unless someone explains it to me? Now, we're going to echo this in a couple of weeks when we talk about the importance of the church sharing the word of God to the lost and dying of the world. But what we see in this passage is Philip being obedient to the Spirit's calling and God leading him. Taking what God has already said through Jesus to go and make disciples and hearing from the Spirit about how to apply that in a very specific way. Let's take it for us. God's word in James 1.27 says that pure and undefiled religion is this, a command to us to care for the orphan and the widow in their distress. That is a command from Scripture, a command that we ought to be obeying. But the Holy Spirit might impress upon us specific ways for us and the way that we are gifted to live out that command in the world. That God might impress a homeless ministry upon your heart or to join with ours, which we're always needing people to do, by the way. There's a little commercial for you. That God might impress that upon your life through his Holy Spirit. Or that God might, through his Holy Spirit, convict you, if you are financially blessed, to take some of that blessing and share it with an organization like World Orphans next week to help out the orphan and the widow in their distress. It's taking what God has already said in his word and showing us specifically how to live that out. In my own personal life, God has manifested himself in this way. In Acts 1.8, in Luke's version of the Great Commission, Jesus says to everyone gathered there together that they are to go in there to be witnesses, ultimately, to the uttermost parts of the earth, all over the world. But I believe that the Holy Spirit has laid specific locations in which to do that upon my heart. And right now, that specific location is right here on this stage in Grandview, Texas. God, through his Holy Spirit, has taken the truth of the word and led me in a particular direction to obedience. God, through his Spirit, speaks in particular ways to obey what he has already said in Scripture. So we listen. We listen for this kind of movement from God. For God to speak to us in this way. For God to lead us towards certain behaviors, decisions, certain actions that he might be pushing us toward. God used Philip and spoke through him for consequences that led to consequences that you and I don't get to see because we don't get to follow the Ethiopian home. But, but make no mistake about it, this was a powerful man. He was in the queen's court. He had access to royalty in Ethiopia. And he came seeking for truth. He came to worship. There's something in him that led him that direction. Maybe it was what he had heard about, about this God in Israel. Maybe he had even heard some of the things about Jesus. And so he goes and he wants to learn and he wants to worship. And somehow he gets a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, and he's reading it, and God is, it, 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 all of this is coming together in this story. God is speaking through his word to this unbelieving man, and he's wondering about the truth of it, and he needs someone to come alongside of him and help him out, help him out, help him understand what God has said through his word, and so the spirit picks up the phone and calls Philip and says, hey, Philip, I got something that you need to go do. Remember I said, go and make disciples? Here's one. Go this direction, and then when he got to that general area, he also said, hey, Philip, I want you to go up beside this chariot. And then he led him towards sharing the gospel with this powerful man who took it home. And you know it had to make a difference. That the gospel had a foothold in Ethiopia at that point. Now, history would tell us different things. We don't see anything necessarily in Scripture, but it is easy to understand, easy to believe why this was important for someone in his position to take the gospel back home with him. We listen. And when we listen, God has the potential to speak. 
Had Philip not been listening, what might have happened? Now, I'm one of those that knows that God says, or Jesus says, even if the rocks have to cry out, that's what's going to happen. So I think God would have got his plan done with or without Philip. But Philip certainly wouldn't have got to be a part of that plan had he not been listening to the Holy Spirit of God. We listen and we test every voice that we hear. Make sure you're listening to the right voice because it could be something else speaking to you. It could be your own selfishness speaking to you. Before I put myself on a pedestal earlier about hearing a word from the Lord, let me knock myself off real quick. When I was a teenager, after I had already knew that I was called into ministry, there was a weekend coming up, a weekend trip in my church, and a lot of my friends were going, and my pastor slash youth pastor was a small church, he was a young guy, he was going as well, and he and I are still friends today. I went to Virginia a year and a half ago and did a revival for him up there where he's serving now. We still talk every so often. We were close, super close at the time. He's an integral part of why I am doing what I'm doing today. And, and so I wanted to go and I wanted to hang out and I wanted to be a part of this YEC, which is Youth Evangelism Conference in San Antonio. I wanted to be a part of that event. We got the news a few days before we were supposed to leave that my great-grandfather died. Granddad, we called him. My dad's grandfather. And my parents told me, out of wanting to see maturity within me, especially my dad, said, we're going to leave it up to you, whether you go on this trip or whether you stay home and go to the funeral. Because they were basically on the same day. The day that we would leave would be that whole day would be taken up with the funeral. And so I decided, since they were going to leave it up to me, and since this was a religious event that I needed to go and, and be closer to God, I felt that there was something pushing me that direction. And so I decided to go to YC. My parents decided they weren't nearly, I wasn't nearly as mature as I thought that, as they thought I was, and so they told me this is not what you need to do, but I reminded them very quickly, 16, 17 years old, you can imagine how this is going. I reminded them very quickly, you told me I could choose. And so I went. I didn't go to the funeral. I went on that trip, and there I formally accepted the call into ministry. I already knew that God was calling me in that direction, but I walked the aisle that night at one of those events, one of those nights at that event, and I formally accepted what I was already going to do anyway, and it was just a way to pat myself on the back and, and try to explain away a decision that I knew I had made incorrectly. Because it wasn't the voice of God telling me, hey, forget about your family and go on this trip with your friends. That wasn't the voice of God. And you know what? If I had had the word hidden in my heart, I would have known that. I would have known that that was the case. Because there's this story that Jesus tells. not a story. It's actually a confrontation that he has with the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7. And in this confrontation, he tells them, the Pharisees, Hey guys, you consider your tradition more important than the word of God. And here's proof for you. Because here's what you do. Moses has told you, because God told Moses, that you should honor your mother and father. And that anyone who reviles their mother and father is going to die. Moses told you that. But Pharisees, here's what you guys do. Instead of being obedient to that word, you take money that you know should be for your parents. Now, in that day, a son was supposed to care for his elderly parents. There was no social system or anything to care for someone elderly and unable to provide on their own. So the Pharisees, the sons, were supposed to take care of that. And what these Pharisees were doing with the money that they should have been giving to their parents was saying, Hey, Mom, Dad, I know you need some money, but this money is dedicated to God. I can't give it to you. It's God's money. And Jesus told the Pharisees that by doing that, you have made void the word of God. And so right there in scripture, from the mouth of Jesus himself, we see a principle that you cannot blame it on God when you want to do your own thing. That the job of a child, the job of any family member is to first care for the family. He echoes that sentiment later in scripture when we learn that the man who does not take care of his own household is worse than an infidel. If I had known that, I wouldn't have been able to blame that voice inside me on God. And I would have known it was my own selfishness at work, not a word from the Holy Spirit. Test, because it could be your own selfishness speaking. It could be the voice of a false teacher as well. Jesus in the New Testament reminds us over and over again. Matthew 24, 24 is one example. 
where Jesus tells us to guard against the false teacher because they're out there performing signs and miracles, trying to lead you astray, even the elect, if they can, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24, it could be the voice of a false teacher, a voice that is alive and well in the world today and that we must be guarding ourselves against. Here's a conviction that came upon me even just this morning as I was thinking about how to articulate this exact point. You guys should be testing everything that I'm saying to you right now. Now, I never come up here and intend to say anything that is outside the Word of God. I take this matter very seriously, especially a sermon like this one, where there's, you know, I'm worried that I'm going to misrepresent what God's actually saying, and so I come up here trembling. But I recognize my own human frailty and my own sinfulness to recognize that there could be a day that I come up here after a terrible week and I'm in a terrible spot and maybe I'm living in disobedience and I come and I say something to you that is not out of this book and you will not know if you don't know this book. Because what happens too much in the world today is that this, this hour on Sunday morning is the only spiritual sustenance that much of the Christians in the world are getting. And so people come and they're starving because you're not feeding yourself on the word on a daily basis. You're not living in the spirit and the presence of the spirit of God in prayer. And so you come up here and you've had no spiritual food all week long and you're desperate and you're starving and you'll gobble anything up even if it's fake. And the way that the prosperity gospel is forming around in our world today is proof of that fact. That people come spiritually unnourished, spiritually starving, and they will eat fake food if it's put in front of them. You should be feeding on the real stuff all the time, every day, as much as you can, so that you will know a fake when you see it. And I'm telling you right here, right now, I don't ever intend to bring a fake, but it might happen because I'm a sinful human being. And I want you to be prepared to know the difference between truth and reality. Truth does not start here. It starts here. And that is the case with every teacher. So we should guard ourselves by testing every word because it might be selfish, our own voice, and it might be the voice of a false teacher. And it could even be the voice of the evil one. In Genesis 3, at the fall of Adam and Eve, we see Satan show up in the picture And he says to Eve, if you remember the story, has God really said that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? If you know the scripture, if you know chapter two, you know that that's not what God said. God said you should, you can eat from any tree of the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve tells the serpent that. No, God says, she adds to it a little bit, which is a whole other thing, but she says, no, God didn't say we couldn't eat from any tree. He said we could eat from all of them except for this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan responds to her, you surely won't die. Even though God had told them that would be the consequence if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The very first interaction Satan has with humanity is to attempt to distort the word of God. That's the very first thing he does in Scripture. is to lie, cheat, and steal your truth away from you by lying about what God has already said. If you don't know what God has already said, you're in danger. And so you ought to be hiding it in your word. So how do we test the word? 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Scripture is the authoritative manifestation of God's word in the world today. All other words should be tested against the word of God in Scripture. Remember that idea of echoing what God has already said that we talked about last week and the week before it. Hearing a word from God is not the same as going from your gut that you just feel it. No, you have to test it against the rest of the testimony of Scripture. We said this last week and it needs to be repeated. If a word is not in accordance with Scripture, it is not from God. Now, let me hesitate you on one way we can take that out of context and, and, and fool our way around and still hearing our own voice or someone else's. It, it doesn't mean that if you feel like you, a voice is telling you something and you go to Scripture and you don't find an explicit disagreement, that you should go ahead and do it anyway. Like, I think God's telling me to move, and I can't find any Scripture that says, Thou shalt not move, so it must mean that God is telling me I should move. No, it, it's not about trying to negate what you're already saying. We must confirm Not negate, confirm any word we feel we have received from God with the words of Scripture. 
before we accept that word as actually being from God. That we find agreement in Scripture. That what we are doing doesn't not just go against Scripture, but is actually living in accordance and confirmation of Scripture. Because God takes what he has already said in his word, and through his Holy Spirit shows us specific and contextual ways to obey that in our own lives. We test by taking a word that we think we're hearing against the word of God. And another way that we do that, and this is a commercial for next week, is by taking it before wise counsel, before brothers and sisters in Christ who know the word, talking with them about it, making sure we're understanding correctly. God is speaking. He has spoken through Jesus Christ everything that needs to be said, and he continues to do so through the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ within us in a way that echoes what he has already said, in a way that confirms what he has already said, in a way that shows us in our world in 2018, in our corner of our world, how we live out what God has already said. Listen for a word from God by living in relationship with his son Jesus. I missed that earlier. It was one of the bold lines as we listen for God, to listen for the voice of God means to live in relationship with God and His Spirit. Again, the, the reason why Philip heard from God wasn't because Philip went out into a field by himself and says, God, I'm desperate for a word from you. No, Philip was living in relationship with God through His Holy Spirit. And because of that, he was able to hear that voice that told him how to go and apply what God had already said through His Word through the word of Jesus Christ himself. And as we are living in relationship with God, not occasionally begging for a word, but as we live in relationship with God, that is how we listen to the guiding of the one who knows far better than we do, of the one who has spoken truth completely manifested through his son Jesus and brought to us via this word and it dwells us with that same word. Jesus is the word of God. And this word testifies to that word. And together they lead us to be obedient, to share truth, to make a difference in the world around us, and to be in the exact place that God would have us be. Here's what I love about this passage in relationship to last week. Many of you might say, God would never speak to me in that way. I'm, I'm, I'm too foolish, or, or I don't believe enough, or blah, blah, blah. Last week, in John 14, Philip was the guy who looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, just show us the Father, and that will be enough. When Jesus responded back to him, yo, he didn't say that. This is my translation. Yo, Philip, how long have we known each other, man? And you've missed it. I've been with you this whole time. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The one that Jesus responds to with that incredulity is Philip, the same guy in this passage in Acts who hears from an angel and from the Holy Spirit himself a word about where to go. And because he heard and obeyed, he was able to see God move through him to save a lost soul, a lost soul who took the gospel back to his home with him and undoubtedly saw other people changed by it. If God can use that man, he can use you. And if God can speak to Philip or Peter through his Holy Spirit, he can speak to you today. Are you listening? And do you know and use the word of God, the Holy Scriptures enough, to when you do hear, to test it and confirm it before you decide to follow it? It's a messy middle. But if we live in that middle hearing from God and testing everything that we hear to make sure it's from him, God can say and do amazing things to and through us. God is speaking. Are you listening? Are you testing? And are you following? And as we move into our time of invitation this morning, I encourage you just to think on these words. If there's anybody here who is not a believer in Jesus Christ, I believe that one thing that the Holy Spirit always leads us to do is to respond in faith to the message of the gospel. And if you would like to do that today, I could tell you what that looks like to believe in and follow Jesus as Savior. You can come down during our time of invitation or you can find me after the service if you would like to do that.
If there's anybody here who is looking for a church home and you would like to join this one, it would be a great time to do that as well during our time of invitation. You can just come down and we can do that together. But for all of you in this room, those of you who believe in Jesus, during this time, I encourage you not to beg God for a specific word, but to listen and to commit yourself to studying the scriptures and listening to the spirit within you so that you can be obedient in the same way that Philip was. I believe Bill is going to come and lead our song of invitation this morning. And as he does that, may we all allow God to speak to us and respond in whatever way he is leading us to do. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray. And again, as Bill leads us to the song of invitation, you move in whatever way God is calling. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for truth, truth of the word, and truth that testifies within us through your presence within us and your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that we would be open to hear words from you. God, I pray that everyone in here would have a relationship with you through prayer and through reading of the word so that they might be open to hear and feel any leading. And God, I pray that we would take seriously our responsibility to do due diligence and make sure that we are hearing from you before we act on anything that might have come from somewhere other than Scripture. God, we want to follow you. And we want to work out that salvation with fear and trembling. God, we want to make sure we're on the right page. So God, would you lead us even now to listen to your word, to test it, so that we might be obedient. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.